my praises roar How many of you guys believe that this morning, today, church, that the king is still alive? Yes. I searched the world, yeah. and it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And pull me back together Every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Often, but would you just turn around and just say hi to someone really quick? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. If you guys want to just stand again and just um, join us in worship, that'd be fantastic. You know what? I wanted to sing this song because I think a lot of us forget that God's promises will happen. God's promises are simple, as simple as yes and amen. 
So whatever you guys are praying for, whatever you guys are deliverance for something or whatever it is, God is there with you. And his promises are yes and amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen.
How many of you guys believe that this morning? get into it. Uh, you know, when I played basketball in high school, I know it may not look like, like it now, but we, could, we would spend time watching footage of the other teams. Why? Well, because we have to know our opponent. Our coach was doing so well to groom us to say, every team we're going to play is different. 
every team will bring a different kind of strength and a weakness. And so when the coach would sit us down and we watch these highlights of them playing a, another team, we sit down and watch and the coach would make comments saying, see what this person is doing? Oh, Andy, I need you to cover this guy because he's fast, he's quick, you got quick hands. And he would design any kind of defense any kind of offense to actually play those teams. So sometimes we didn't have the same offense and defense, and every game we went to is something different. Why? To take on the opponent that we're going we're gonna to go against and to be smart and wise of how to beat them. This morning, I want to remind you, actually wake you up, that we have a supernatural opponent, and his name is Satan and his demons. We have a powerful contender who wants to discourage and deceive us. But listen, we have a champion named Jesus. The greater, and he's greater than that. And there's no contender that can ever stand up to Jesus. No contender. That's who's on our side. He's our coach. And he's telling us in some of scripture saying, hey, I want to let you know. This is an opponent. You need to be ready. And guess what? Would you agree that these opponents come in different ways? In a whole different ways. Just get on the news. He'll do it in such a way that, and this is incredible, he'll do it in such a way that it's an attack on you personally. Well, hold that. It tells you a lot about their, their strategy and power, doesn't it? That they know your weakness. They know what it took for you to get here this morning. They know right now what you're thinking. Maybe you're just like, you know what? I don't even want to listen to this. I want to tell you, God has you here for a reason this morning. And I want to tell you, every time I mention or start studying about something like this, the supernatural that's against us, I'm telling you, I always have the hardest week. It always gets me. Why? Because I, he doesn't want to, me to preach this message. And you're like, Andy, what are you talking about this morning? We'll get there. But I want to take you back to a particular scene in the book of Mark. You see, the disciples of Jesus had just been involved in a furious storm while sailing from one shore to another. And the Bible describes the sailing scene as this, extreme winds and waves breaking over the boat and taking in water. But if you look at the passage that I'm talking about and we're getting to, the disciples had front seats to Jesus commanding the wind to be still. In one phrase, be still. He almost rebukes them saying, hey, 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 I'm talking here. Everybody stop. Now, what would that have been like if for all of us on the boat and Jesus stands up and says, be quiet and be still and everything comes to a dead calm? It's interesting because the Bible says the disciples were terrified when they, when they heard this and when they saw this. Why? Because they, and they said this to, to, to themselves. They didn't say it out loud, but Jesus knows their, their mind and what they're thinking. He says, who is this man who commands creation to be still? Who is this man that's in our boat? Who can say to the creation, bam, stop, be still? They were baffled and yet astonished at Jesus' power. But listen, they're coming off the boat and they get to a place called Gerasenes. And what's going to happen here and what they're about to witness next would be a greater eye opener to who Jesus is. And I want you to follow along with me. We pick it up in the story in Mark chapter 5. And look at verse 2 and 5 say, When Jesus got out of the boat, remember they just came from that squall, if you will. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. Get this, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And in verse 5, it says, Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stone. So what do we know about this man? You know me so far as you begin to hear me more and more is that I like to find out what is this man? Who's approaching him? Well, we had a lot here. The first thing is he's demon-possessed. Right? He said, the Bible said in verse 2, that the man had an impure spirit. Some of your translations might say unclean spirit or evil spirit. I like how the New Revised Standard Version describes the man's circumstance. He says this, There met from the tombs a man in the grip of an unclean spirit. So what does demon possession mean? What does demon possession mean? It means, listen, that there's a supernatural evil spirit indwelling in a person. 
It's taken over physically, mentally, and spiritually. And in a real sense, it's controlling them. You see, demons are able to, uh, to manifest their evil nature through human beings. And somebody might say, Andy, is this real today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Demons are real. Satan is real. Don't ever think that just because we read in the Bible, it can happen today. He is a powerful being, strategic, and multiple angels, demons, trying to get you. Now listen, we say this, who is then is susceptible to being demon-possessed? Because I have to answer this question. Now listen, this is a huge subject. I can go 10 different ways. So I'm skimming, if you will, but according to this passage. But if you have more questions, hey, put it on your comic card. Andy, what about this? What about this? So the, these are a couple questions that are prompted. Who is susceptible to being demon-possessed? And here's the answer. Someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. You got that? Someone who doesn't have the Spirit of God living inside them. Listen carefully. If you don't believe in Jesus, there's a battle for your soul. There's a battle for your soul going on. You become susceptible to demons by allowing him the power to possess. You're giving him, them, an open door to your heart. But that's only, listen, that's only one of Satan's strategies. His focus is to keep everyone far away from God as possible. He will use any means in this world to distract you from a relationship with Jesus. And guess what? He distracts not only people who don't believe, he distracts Christians you know where I see this most? And I don't want to go off 100 tangents, but you know where I see this most? When people are saying, I'm a spiritual person, I'm a Christian, but they have no recollection, they have no knowledge who Jesus is. Guess what? If you don't believe in Jesus, he's not indwelling in your heart. And sometimes Christians can have this spiritualism, I'm a spiritual person, and, and yet still not know the Savior. And guess what? Satan and his demons are like, this is what I want. This is exactly what I want. I just know this, that they're going to take as many people as they can. They know their end, and we'll get to that in a second. Well, here's the second question that's prompt. Is everybody with me so far? Good. Are Christians susceptible to demon possession? This is a great question. And actually, and over my years in ministry, I bet Steve has said the same thing. That's been a question that always comes up. Well, hold on. I'm afraid. I'm a Christian. Am I ever going to be demon possessed? Here's scripture for you that tells you that answer. In Ephesians 1 through 13 through 14, it says this. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your celebration, uh, cel salvation. Look at this. When you believed, what happened? You were marked in him with a seal. Now, let me ask you a question before I finish this. Who could break God's seal? No one. He's God. He's inside of you. I like that. Marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. My friends, we are marked with an unbreakable sea, seal. You're God's possession. The Holy Spirit has taken residence in your heart that can't be moved or messed with. That is a promise. That is the truth. So you never have to worry about it. Now, hold on. Andy, is there such thing as demon uh, uh, oppression? Yes, that's a different message. We're not going to get there. Okay, so here we go. So we asked you those questions. Who is susceptible? Are Christians susceptible? But here's the first thing we already talked about is what we discovered the man approaching Jesus, that he's possessed. The second thing we learned about this man, he lived in the tombs in the hills. Why was this so important? Well, listen, these tombs were different than what we are, what the cemeteries are us today, like us today. They were burial chambers carved out in the hillside and usually away from the town. This man took a residence up there. This is where he lived, and also the hills. So he'd go back and forth between the hills and, the, if you will, the cemetery, the tombs. He was isolated from society. And although you find in another written account, if you read, because in the Gospels, you find, hey, well, this is the same story from a different point of view. Well, if you read in another account, it'll have two demon-possessed men. But Mark concentrates on the one. This man was considered a nuisance and a danger to the nearby towns. Why else were often people often trying to detain him? He might have been coming in the towns, in the villages, or whatever, or seeing kids, or whatever, and it scared them half to death. It would scare us half to death, wouldn't it? 
It's also interesting here that if we're following Mark's timeline of when this is happening, remember, they just came off the lake. This situation most likely takes place later in the evening when it's dark. Could this be all the more eerie for the disciples and Jesus getting off the boat and they see this demon-possessed man coming? The third thing we learned about this man is that he demonstrated a supernatural strength. It's a, it, verses 3 through 4 describes his strength with great description. No one could bind him. He tore chains apart and broke the irons off his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. I now have, after you've seen the wedding photos, I now have two son-in-laws over, the, over six foot tall and they're big boys. And I often, and I always fool around with them. Every time I see them, I often will give them a hug and then I try to push them around like this, kind of beat them up a little bit. And you know what? They don't move at all. They just say, you know, and I know that this, they can just hit me on the head and I would go down. <laughs> Nobody can still do them. But my friends, the person, this demon possessed man is not part of the, the World Federation of Wrestling or he's, he's jacked up on drugs. My friends, this is a supernatural evil power taking over a man. What does it tell you about our adversary? He's powerful, not to be messed with. Actually, you should have a respect for that and know, and that's why I want us to wake up this morning to know that our opponent is powerful. Everybody understand that? The fourth thing we learned about this man is this. He was being tortured internally and externally. In verse 5, it said, he was crying out. The phrase crying out takes on the idea of a continual unearthly scream, an intense emotion. This cry out was the torture internally, while cutting himself with stones was the torture externally. It was self-inflicted because of what's happening inside. That's the only way you can take any of this torture away. And this torture was relentless. There were no timeouts or reprieve. The verse says the torture was night and day. My friends, we have an adversary that doesn't take a break. Can I, can I have an amen on that? He doesn't take a break. But we also, again, have Jesus who never takes a break at all. He's right there. And when the Holy Spirit's right here, that's when we begin to tap into him and say, God, I can't do this. I can't take on this addiction. I can't take on this relationship. I can't deal with all my bills. I can't deal with life. But guess what? Jesus is like, I'm right here. Just tap in. Tap me in so I can help you with this. Give you the strength. Give you the wisdom. Give you the perspective that we have. In verses 6 through 10, describes what happens when Jesus comes on the scene. I love this. Look at verse 6. It says, And when he saw Jesus from a distance, who's he? Well, it's the demon-possessed man. Saw Jesus from a difference. Don't you love this? He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't what? Torture me. For Jesus had said to them, Come out of this man, you impure, impure spirit. Hey, there was the exorcism right there. Come out of this man. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are what? We're many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. My friends, I want you to catch all that. I want you to notice four truths, truths revealed in, this, in these verses. The first truth is this, that all creation is in submission to Jesus. All creation is in submission to Jesus. The demons saw Jesus from a distance and did what? Ran and fell. Jesus didn't come to him. They came to him and they ran and fell. Why? Because they're in submission to the creator. Romans 14, 11 says this. Interesting. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So even Satan and the demons acknowledge who God is. Did you ever realize that? They know exactly who he is. And they submit to him. And I love that verse because it's not subject to time. Did you ever think about that verse like that? It's not subject to time. In other words, every knee has bowed and every knee will bow. The demons bow because he's a created being and all creation is in submission to Jesus. All creation will always be subject to our creator. Here's the second truth. Satan and his demons know exactly who Jesus is. 
He knew who he was. He wasn't God the Father. He wasn't the Holy Spirit. He was Jesus. And verse 7 said that he shouted at the top of his voice, this demon. He said what? What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? They know about God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. It's not like, hey, we just see Jesus. No, they understand. In the book of James, the writer, the right, the right, uh, James writes that, that demons believe there is only one God. And they shudder at the knowledge. I love that. They know how their banishment from heaven started. Because some people are saying, hold on, hold on. You're telling me that God created Satan and his angels? Yes, he did. But look what happened in Ezekiel chapter 28, 15 through 16. Because you're saying, well, hold on. You're saying an angel has a will? Yes, they do. Because they decided to get out of heaven. And I'll tell you why. Well, actually banished from heaven. Look what it says in Ezekiel chapter 28. It says, you, talking of Satan, were blameless in your ways. So how did he start out? He was a good angel. From the days you were created. So there's that, there's that answer right there. Who created him? Well, God created him. And then it says, till wickedness was found in you. Though you're widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sin. So what did God do? So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub. Let me tell you something. When it says guardian cherub, you know what that means? He was a high-ranking angel. He was up there. Satan was a, a high-ranking angel until, guess what? Ultimately, he wanted God's job. And God's like, no way. You know, he wanted everybody to worship him. He started looking at himself. And doesn't remind you of sin? He started looking at himself and hey, you know what? I am deserved worthy. I, you know what? I'm a pretty powerful angel. You know what? I'm going to take your place, God. That's where it started. And think about this also. The disciples were just on the boat with Jesus trying to figure out who Jesus is. Who is this man that can command the creation and now you have a supernatural evil spirit calling Jesus son of the most high God. Isn't that interesting? They're questioning it inside of them and saying, who is this man? And the, the demon comes and says, this is Jesus, son of the most high God. Wow. So they were also testifying to the disciples. This is an eye opener. Why is this so important that just, that just has happened? Here's the first reason. Because Satan and his demons want nothing more than to tell you there is no God. Or Jesus is not God. They want to distract you from the true God or convince you that, if you will, that Satan isn't real. You know he's in that business too? Not only that there's no God, that he wants to convince you that he's not real. There's no, hey, you know, there's no being that creates this evil or wants to do evil. Oh, and yet... The, those angels, those demons still believe. They know who God is. In reference to Satan, convincing people he's not real, there was a song written a long time ago by a man named Keith Green who presents what Satan is thinking. It's like his memoir. And allow me to read some of the lyrics to the song. It's called, No One Believes Me Anymore. Listen to these incredible lyrics. Now remember, this is like Satan's memoir to himself. He says, oh, my job keeps getting easier as time keeps slipping away. I can imitate your brightest light and make your night look just like day. I put some truth in every lie to tickle itching ears. You know, I'm drawing people just like flies because they like what they hear. I'm gaining power by the hour. They're falling by the score. You know, it's getting very simple now because no one believes me anymore. Oh, heaven's just a state of mind. My books read on the shelf. Or have you heard that God is dead? I made that one up myself. They dabble in magic spells and get their fortunes read. You know, they heard the truth, but turned away and followed me instead. I used to have to sneak around, but now they just open up their doors. You know, no one's watching for my tricks because no one believes me anymore. Everyone's like a winner. With my help, you're guaranteed to win. Hey, man, you ain't no sinner. You got the truth within. And as your life slips by, you believe the lie and you did it on your own. But don't worry. I'll be there to help you share our dark eternal home because no one believes me anymore. This is written decades ago. And isn't it true today? Tickling ears, making 
He, they called, the Bible says he can be an angel of light. It could look like he's God. This is why it's so important to be in here, everybody. You know why? Don't make up who God is and who Jesus is. This is what Satan wants. He wants you to have the right, doesn't want you to have the right definition. He wants to come to you as an angel of light. This is me. This is God. He's representing because he wants to be God. And that's why we have to decipher and say, God, is this you? It's so important, church. And guess what? We've seen churches go that way. And I never want to talk about other churches. But man, some of the pastors now, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really, I just, you were so in God's word now. And everything is changing. The whole doctrine of who Jesus is, even who the Bible is. And it's scary as a pastor. But I want to let you know, you keep me accountable. And you're veering away. What are you talking about? Why is it becoming more secular? Whatever the case is, keep me accountable. But I'm telling you this, I'm accountable too to the one true God who's the, who's the, who's the leader of this church. And I want to make sure I'm steering this church in the way of Jesus and biblically. I got three more hours. Stick with me. There's a second reason. The first one is uh, first, first, first reason why, uh, you know, Satan, we recognize that Satan and his demons know exactly who Jesus is and why that's so important. I said, Satan and his demons want nothing more to tell you there is no God. The second reason is this. We have Jesus on our side if we ever encounter such evil. In other words, if we ever and ever get face to face with evil circumstances, we can say, guess what? I'm with Jesus. I'm with that guy. Yes. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying that you're going to do it. I'm not going to say it's going to happen. You're going to meet a demon possessed person or somebody who's all I'm telling you is that Jesus is right with you. And all you need to do when you face those circumstances, like I'm with Jesus. And guess what? I have the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. And in that name, I have authority over those demons because Jesus is with me. Now, listen very carefully. doesn't mean we go demon hunting. You know, if you read chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you say, put on the full armor of God. Guess what? It never says in that packet, passage to go after them. You know why? Because they're coming to you. <laughs> They're not going to, you don't have to go looking for them. And I've heard even, even Christians say, well, man, I'm just going to go fight evil. Why? You're not meant to fight evil. Just know who God is and be ready. Wake up that these demons and his evils coming for you. The third truth revealed in these verses is this. Satan's demons are numerous. In verse 9, Jesus asked the demons his name and he said, my name is Legion. And it's interesting because the demon used terminology for that era to express multiple demons. You see, a legion was a Roman regiment of 6,000 men. That doesn't mean there were 6,000 demons in, the, in this man. What it signifies is that there's a large amount of demons present in him. You see the capability? You see the power of evil and what they can do? The Bible tells us that when God banished Satan, Satan influenced a third of the angels. He took a third of them with him. To go with him. And so I want to tell you that Satan has plenty of helpers to assist in his plan. Everybody still with me? Just say yes. Okay, fourth truth revealed in this verse. Fourth truth. God will deal with Satan, will deal with Satan and his angels in the end. Isn't that great? Yeah. Again, we just we know the end story. We know the end of the book. We know the end of the movie. And verse 7 gives us a foreshadow of the future. The demon said to Jesus, in God's name, don't torture me. And isn't it interesting that the demons are torturing the man, and now they're asking Jesus not to torture them? In verse 10, he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. You see, the demon knew that Jesus had the power to end their existence right there and there, right then and there, or to send them somewhere else to a torturous place, or send them any place. Now listen, the writer Luke shares the same story. Remember I told you different gospels have the same story. And the writer Luke shares the same story from a different, from different angle and writes this. And they, talking of demons, begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. You're like, hold on, Andy, what's the abyss? Look, we don't have time to go into it, but let me just give you a simple answer. The abyss can be best described as a prison for evil spirits. But guess what? They can come in and out. They can come in and out. So all we know is that they didn't want to go there. They didn't want God to put them in the monopoly jail at all. They wanted nothing better. And then they say, hey, well, put us in the pigs. They preferred to go into the swine. 
But my friends, but there will be a time when God will wipe them out completely. And it's going to be incredible. Can you imagine no more temptation? I can't. (laughs) I can't. No more temptation for any of us. It's going to be incredible. Nobody's sitting there trying to oppress. Nobody's trying to, Satan doing his evil schemes and anything like that. Because when we're with the Father in heaven, oh man, we're going to be in a different place. Well, the demons continued the conversation with Jesus in verses 11 through 13. Look what it said. I call this, this one uh, bacon wasted. Here we go. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pin, pigs, allowing us to go into them. And I love this. Verse 13, remember this. He gave them permission. They can ask all they want, but Jesus is the authority still, remember? And he's like, look, I got to give you permission. You got to ask me. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, can you imagine the noise? Rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. In verses 14 through 17, we'll find three responses from the farmer, the man, and the people. Look what it says. It says, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And then verse 15, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been demon-possessed, past tense, by the legion of demons. And look at this. He was sitting there, dressed in his right mind. And they were what, everybody? They were afraid. Wow. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. In verse 17, then the people begin to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Here's the first response is the farmers. They ran off. They were going to go report this eyewitness news, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram. Well, at that time, they're like, we got to tell people about what just happened. Remember, this is supernatural. This is not something they see every day. They don't have the movies that we have that say, well, that's pretty cool. There's Jurassic Park. That really happened, right? No, but you're with me so far. Understanding that there's, they're telling people about what happened. Well, we see a second response. The man, the man that was demon-possessed, I love this, is now just sitting there. He was torturing himself. He was probably bloody. He was probably, as we'll see in this, he was probably naked or half-clothed. And he was dressed in his right mind. You see, this demon, this crazy demon-possessed lunatic was a new man, listen, because of Jesus. Jesus has the authority to cast out demons and make this man free. And all Jesus needed to say is this, come out of this man, bam. And guess what? Jesus is so powerful in God. He doesn't need to say it. He said it for everybody else to hear. Jesus had to think it. Get out of here, man. And let's remember when Jesus healed people from impure spirits, and even when he healed people, it was always immediate. When you start reading God's word, you'll understand that. Do people go away and say, hey, God, you know, you didn't, didn't get my right leg when you healed me. No, you don't see that. When, when you talk about demon possession, everybody, when Jesus casts out demon, it's complete. There is no remnants because he's God and they submit to him. And the third response is this, the people. Verse 15 says, the people were afraid. That word actually means terrorized by what they saw. And remember what verse 17 said? Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their reason. They wanted Jesus to get out of town. We don't want you here. But here's the question. Why were people afraid? I think there's two reasons. First reason is this. It makes sense. They didn't want to incur any more economic loss. How many pigs? 2,000, that's a lot. That's a lot. And remember, a lot of wealth was what you had back then. That's 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of bacon, like I said. Oh, man. But that's a lot of bacon. <laughs> they wanted him out. They didn't want him to do anything else because I'm like, what is he going to do next? Is he going to take my sheep? What is he going to do? Is he going to gonna kill all the trees? He's like, we don't want this man here because he's going to interrupt our livelihood. The second reason is this, and this is the most important, because something supernatural happened that was beyond the scope of the natural. My friends, if we were there and we didn't know who Jesus was, we would be in awe about the supernatural power that's happening right there. The magnitude of what happened supernaturally scared them. They knew about demon possession, but to witness Jesus supernaturally take power and say, come out of that man, 
And bringing Batman back physically and spiritually and mentally is mind-blowing. It's eerie. It's real. And it was on their front porch. In verses 18 through 20, Jesus is getting back in the boat. And the man who was healed from the demon possession asked him, Jesus, I want to come with you. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You know what I want you to do? I want you to go tell everybody how, what the Lord has done for you. And the Bible says, as you read later by yourselves, he goes to the capitalist. It's 10 cities. And you know what I love about this? The man didn't say, Jesus, come on, I want to come with you. You healed me. No, he just said, I'll do what you want. I'll tell everybody, everybody that listens to me what happened. And can you imagine him coming up to some families in these cities that he knows or cousins or whatever the case is, and he's like, hey, remember me? And they're like, whoa, whoa. Last time I knew about you, you were, you were living in the tombs. You were on the hillside. My friends, we too have that same kind of good news everywhere we go. You know why? Because we were in condemnation and now we're not. We have a supernatural message to share and live out today. And I love what Romans 8, 1 and 2 says. It says, that there, therefore, there is no condemn, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. You see, we have a supernatural righteousness of Christ in us, and we're no longer separated from God. And guess what? Now we're going to say it not to our cities. We're going to say it to every social sphere that we go into. That's our good news. That we were in a place of like, hold on, we're not connected to God? No, until you believe, then you're reconnected, you're justified, you're made righteous so God the Father can look at you and say, oh, you're one of my sons, I, I know you, I know you. That's what it's all about. Here's the concluding thing as the band gets ready to come up. I just want you to remember two things. The first thing is this. This subject is never meant to scare you. It is meant to wake us up. And to remember that Satan, listen, and I'm saying this scripturally, that Satan is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So the subject is never meant to scare you. The second thing is this. The subject is never meant to discourage you. Why? Because Satan and his demons are merely contenders compared to our champion, Jesus. Whew, they're just contenders. So I hope this message this morning would be a wake-up call that somebody's after us. You never have to run to the battle. The battle's always coming to you. That's why it's so important that we do put on the full armor of God. And you know what, my friends? It's not a, it's not a weekly thing on Sunday morning. Say, hey, I'll put it on today. No, no, no. It's a moment-by-moment -moment time. I mean, it could be one hour, one time. You're like, I need the full armor right now, God, because I can't do it myself. And I'm going to tell you, even right now, I have to think about, God, where, where is Satan trying to just infiltrate in my life? And you know exactly where he is in your life in doing that. Let me encourage you, wake up. Wake up and know that the power of God is living inside you and start tapping into it. Are you with me on that? Let's pray together. God, thank you for this morning. Oh, God, these simple stories sound simple, but they're not. Oh, man, if we can leave here with one message is that, Jesus, you're our champion. And until we see you face to face, we're going to have somebody on the, on the prowl, on the move, coming for us so that, God, we think of you different. Satan is doing everything he can, and his demon is doing everything he can to get us away from the truth of who you are to distract us. God, I think about all the things that are distracting in my life. And I simply want to put those distractions at your feet because I can't do it alone. I won't be able to do it alone. I got to tap into the most powerful thing that you've given me, the promised Holy Spirit, the seal, the guaranteed inheritance that I have with you. God, help us to tap in as a church, as we as a church come to places where we're going to have to fight some evil sometimes. God, I, I pray that we would be ready. We'd wake up and know that you're on our side. God, help us to always point to you and say, I'm with him. <laughs> In your name.
Pastor Andy, for that beautiful message. If you guys want to stand with us and just worship before we get sent off home. next week. God bless.